Hi there. In this lecture, we are going to talk about Confucianism and more broadly, the art of the Han Dynasty. In our previous lecture on the Shang and Qin Dynasty, we did mention Confucius had lived in this time known as the Warring States period, a time of confusion and chaos, and that his followers were actually persecuted during the Qin dynasty. It is now only in the Han dynasty, as they had sort of rejected all things that were a part of the Qin dynasty, that the Han began to recognize Confucius as a very important source of knowledge and wisdom, and they began to promote his teachings within their scholarly ranks. So, going back to this Warring States period, who exactly was Confucius? The name Confucius is actually the spelling comes to us from the first Jesuit scholars who arrived in China in the 17th century and began to kind of learn about this great wise man, Confucius. He's also known as Master Kong. He was born in 552 BCE in the region of Khufu. Apparently, he was uh, a child of a minor official, born to a noble family that sort of hit hard times. He uh, was not a terribly attractive man, and he did not have great charm or personality. He uh, was a person who was fatherless and he could not rely on family relations, wealth, or any other sort of natural gifts to make his way in the world. And so he realizes early on that he needs to focus on studies and become a scholar as his only opportunity for survival. And he has a very interesting saying that he is said later in life, you must study as if Someone might take your books away at any moment, which sounds like someone who has spent a good deal of his time being bullied and picked on. And so he devoured his studies and made that his cause, and he became known as a very wise scholar, eventually becoming the governor of a prefecture, and then late in life was forced into exile. Now, in this time, we don't know much about him, but eventually he settles down and becomes a teacher and here gathers around a great many students around him. And it's these students that would eventually record what he said to them and they compiled his teachings into what is now called the Analects. And this is the sort of the hallmark of what we have and what defines of Confucian values and ideas. As I mentioned, Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi uh, was a legalist, meaning he wanted everyone to do exactly as they were told. He didn't want independent thinkers. He didn't want people pursuing knowledge on their own. He wanted people to follow the law. And so he persecuted Confucian scholars, and it said he had Confucian books burned and 450 scholars killed. And it is through this persecution that eventually Confucianism in the next dynasty actually has a kind of halo of virtue about it because it becomes this thing that was so hated by the Qin, the Han dynasty takes it up. And in 140 BCE, an imperial college was established by Emperor Wu, whereby um, the upper class uh, people could go and learn and study and prepare to enter into the imperial bureaucracy, become magistrates, become governors, and work toward maintaining this bureaucracy of the Chinese empire. The imperial exams began in 605 CE during the Sui dynasty. And they, the Jin Qi is the highest final degree of the imperial examination in China. The examination was usually taken in the imperial capital of the palace. It was also called the Metropolitan Exam. Only 1% of the people who took the exam would pass it. 
Here we see a picture of a Cheats handkerchief in 1860. This is a silk document that is intricately uh, written with a vast number of Chinese characters. This is actually just a tiny detail of the whole handkerchief. So someone who was brought into the exam, they would be brought into their small cubicle and they would be given brush and some paper and they were supposed to write on some pertinent question uh, that they were given right there and there and then they were supposed to present this to the examiners in hope of passing this exam. They often had guards on the top looking down on the cells so that make sure that people did not kill themselves. Uh, this was an incredibly stressful uh, part of the rising to the ranks so that the only the most intelligent and the most skilled scholars were brought into the imperial governance. Over time, the exam would become longer and more complicated and include not just Confucian texts, but other administrative legal ideas and concepts, and people would spend decades preparing for the exam. Ultimately, only the very rich could really afford to prepare for the exam. Jesuits who visited and would be the first Westerners to uh, study Confucianism in China were impressed by the idea and eventually became a practice to have a civil servant exams elsewhere in Europe and the United States. You could say that today's ACT exams and SAT exams are in a sense um, a part of the legacy of Confucian scholarship. Let's talk about some of the ideas that we find in Confucianism. I find this one especially uh, interesting quote uh, from the Analects where Confucius says, to study and not think is a waste. To think and not study is dangerous. Now this this phrase speaks to the idea of Confucianism because it means that rote memorization is not very productive. And yet, to have a, an idea and to make an opinion that is not based on study is dangerous. People who have opinions or follow their gut feeling about something are dangerous to society and a stable, stable society. And Confucius is all about a stable society. So, in this one, he contraposes this idea of studying and thinking. And for Confucius, to study was a solitary act. And to think was really a kind of social and communal way of exchanging ideas. And so you wanted to not just learn something, but you wanted to find a way to communicate it, to share it, to integrate it in a way that it was meaningful and useful. And it's like very utilitarian ideas about function and purpose in knowledge. I have an image here of a statue of Confucius that was erected in Tiananmen Square. It's a very important space in the city of Beijing where not a stone's throw away from this statue is um, the image of Mao. And so this was erected uh, late in 2010 and then suddenly disappeared four months later under the cover of darkness. No one has ever explained the disappearance of this statue. It's part of the complicated legacy of Confucius in China today that I want to talk about. And I'll make some ideas of why the history and legacy of Confucius is not entirely embraced by all parts of the Chinese government. So Confucius was a person who believed in individual virtue, and that virtue is not something you just talk about. It's by, in a very practical way, the things you do. It's how you act. It's how you present yourself. And of course, how you speak and conduct your business is another important part of virtue. Seeking knowledge is a virtuous act. Looking for the truth is a matter of virtue. And he felt that the people could 
go into that selfless pursuit of honor, honor and knowledge that would honor the emperor, this way in which we look to understand something, this would bring about this transformation of society and make it a stable and enduring place. And so stability was the thing that Confucian was really aiming for. And he said the only way to have stability is through this selfless pursuit of knowledge, to know and recognize when you know something as true and to know when you recognize you don't know something and seek out the truth. So this hierarchy, this structure of, of, of society was a very important foundational idea and that all the members of the government were kind of bought into this. It, it was sort of this common cultural tie that kept the government humming uh, strongly because these were smart, intelligent people who were seeking out the truth and, and excelling in their discovery of new ideas and to help promote the stability of the society. As I mentioned, the legacy of Confucius is not entirely positive. As China went through a series of upheavals in the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was this concern that Confucianism was no longer this engine driving people toward understanding the future, but this very confu conservative ideas that sort of valorized the past and past achievements was really keeping China back. In 1905, the imperial exam was ended as China was struggling to try and come to terms with a, becoming a more modern society. And eventually, Confucian values and ideas would be pillared by the Communist Party, and the teaching was seen as feudalistic and backward. This has changed since the um, death of Mao in the 19, uh, seven, late 70s. We see this re-embrace of con the idea of Confucius as a way of trying to promote Chinese culture abroad, as a way of kind of trying to reinvigorate a kind of moral core to Chinese society uh, that has fallen on hard times. I have spoken with Confucian scholars, and they say that these current ideas of Confucius are a new variety of Confucian teaching that try and meld communist ideology with the sort of Confucian core values. Confucius Institutes have been promoted since uh, 2014, and now there are about 300, 530 Confucius Institutes on six continents. Confucius as a kind of role model, as a kind of cultural icon to which we attribute great wisdom and knowledge, is something that has found elsewhere in Chinese history and culture. There is these legendary characters, uh, Nu Hua and Fu Xi, who are the sort of paired opposites, male and female, who were these sort of culture heroes, and they were able to bring order and build society from their knowledge and their experience. And it's interesting, these sort of intertwined, paired figures with this kind of mythical celestial landscape. This is a painting from the Han Dynasty. And during the Han Dynasty, we start to see more of these sort of images of mythology, images of a kind of legendary um, personages who are these sort of cultural heroes that brought wisdom and knowledge to the Chinese people and sort of extolling this idea of the pursuit of knowledge as a high virtue. So we can see here that Fu Xi looked upward and contemplated the images in the heavens, the stars, the constellations, and looked downward and contemplated the occurrences on earth. He united man and wife, regulated the five stages of change, and laid down the laws of humanity. He devised the eight trigrams, 
in order to gain mastery over the world. Now, the eight trigrams are part of Taoism, and we'll talk more about that. There's this idea of the yin and the yang, and these sort of paired male and female personages have that idea of that sense of yin and yang in them. Another really fascinating object that deals with Chinese mythology at this time is this really extraordinary silk garment called the Fei Yi, the flyaway garment. This is not really a garment you can wear. It is sort of like a banner. And it was found in the tomb of Mawangdu from 168 BCE, the early Han Dynasty. It was a painting on silk. I'm not actually sure how this object was meant or intended to be used, whether it was something symbolic that the deceased would then sort of wear as, uh, as an ancestor among the gods. It would be something that is a kind of way of symbolizing their place in the heavens. We see it has a really interesting hierarchy to it. In the upper parts of the painting, we see images of heaven, and in the lower parts of the picture, we see the underworld and the sort of symbolic making of offerings and those offerings rising up and becoming an important part of this kind of hierarchy uh, where the, the ancestor is being honored. These tombs were discovered in 1972 at Mao Mawangdui, Hunan province in eastern China, and they rank among the greatest archaeological discoveries in China in the 20th century. They are tombs of high-ranking Han official civil servant, the Marquis of Dai, Lady Dai, his wife, and their son. Here, when we look at this uh, portrait of Lady Dai, it is the earliest example we have of a painted portrait of a specific individual in China. She stands on a platform with her servants, two in front and three behind. Lower down in the morning scene, we see the people still on earth who are presenting offerings to her and how they are kind of drawn up to her level in the sort of ancestral realm. Here is Lady Dai and her servants in a detail. On the left, we see in the upper area a toad standing on a crescent moon, flanks a dragon and a human deity. On the right, we see it may be a three-legged crow, which is a traditional symbol of the sun. The moon and the sun are emblematic of supernatural realm above the human world. The dragons and other immortal beings populate the sky. So we have that. These, the ancestor Lady Di now is an intermediary between the celestial realm and the earthly realm, and the offerings that reach her help her sort of be honored among the gods up in heaven. Silk is a very important commodity at this time, and we have these amazing examples of silk objects going all the way back to the Han Dynasty. Uh, this is you know, 2,000 years. Um, uh, garments rarely last this long, and silk, with its incredibly supple and uh, delicate fibers, are incredibly durable as well, and they take and hold color. It was a sort of a miracle material that was discovered sometime possibly in the Shang Dynasty, but during the Han Dynasty, that silk production really becomes this very important commodity that is traded all the way out across to the Mediterranean in what's known as the Silk Road. And it becomes this huge economic power for China to completely control this commodity and understand its manufacture and keep the technology to themselves. And because this would give them this enormous advantage over all other civilizations on the earth at this time. Inside the tombs, as I pointed out in our previous lecture, the objects uh, that are found are no longer these large, imposing, realistic 
statues of warriors and, and other people from the um, Qin dynasty. They become smaller, more stylized, uh, more toy-like, and they represent not military power so much as wealth and luxury, entertainers, performers, the kind of things that a wealthy patron can command to come to their home and perform. And these sort of figures you begin to see more and more. These are stylized characterizations and symbolic representations of wealth rather than actual wealth being burned and destroyed and buried. We see a watchdog tomb figure, this beautifully stylized dog. And another common feature of the Han Dynasty is this money tree, which you can see uh, little details on the branches, coins, um, and the leaves. So the idea of this superabundance, that wealth and prosperity comes into this. And this idea of the tree of immortality and the tree of life is also associated with this idea of the money tree from the Han Dynasty. We also start to see ceramic constructions of architecture um, that are symbols of wealth. This idea of a watchtower, a person who owns a great deal of land and has watchtowers to kind of control and protect their, their territory. This becomes another important symbol. Uh, these ceramic objects uh, are images of wealth copies of the idea of what promotes the sign of someone who is wealthy and has status. Here's another funeral object. Uh, it is in the shape of a silk cocoon, and it is a mortuary jar, and he would hold the remains of offerings to the deceased. It is beautifully painted with this very bold and dramatic shape, and these swirling colors sort of sense of power and and drama in a way it contains this cocoon shape. This is probably one of the most famous of the Ming Qi, the funerary offerings from the Han Dynasty. This is a flying horse, a bronze statue of a horse in mid-stride. Uh, has this incredibly elegant and powerful form. It's also just miraculously held up by a single leg that comes down on the back of a swallow. So the idea of the bird is just soaring as swift. The horse is soaring as swift as a bird. Notice the amazing sense of power and grace in the horse. Horses were the ultimate symbol of power. They were imported from Central Asia. They took a great deal of land and prosperity to raise and to train. And so people who had horses were of the highest levels of society. Another interesting objects we start to see at, in the Han Dynasty is more experiments in ways in which people wrote. During the Qin Dynasty, writing was very formal and dictated. But now, with the overthrow of the Qin, we see these sort of experiments in more fanciful forms of writing, including these inlay bird script, which is really difficult to read. It's distorted in a way that it sort of suggests only the people who really are in the know and have this kind of secret knowledge are able to decipher what it says. Another very important source of information we have about the Han Dynasty comes from these bay rubbings on stone monuments. These are very shallow relief carvings with large sort of flat areas that depict figures and architecture and other sort of religious and mythological scenes. And in this time, the people could actually take uh, paper and lay it down across the wet stone so it adhered firmly, and then very carefully with a crayon rub across the paper, and the raised areas would darken 
and the unraised, the recessed areas would, would stay clear or more clear, creating this sort of easily reproducible pattern. Now, carvings that did this, this is the way people would share and keep these images. So these carvings would be in a tomb in an inaccessible place um, that only the family were allowed. But rubbings would circulate among the population and people would trade them and collect them as a way of kind of uh, show and signs of virtue. And very important rubbings at different times would become really important artifacts that people would cherish. So this rubbing is a really early form of printing, as you can see. And there's a way in which ideas and cultural norms and symbolic uh, thought were sort of passed along among the populations in the Han Dynasty. Here we see some very important images, including the assassinate tape on the Qin Emperor, which becomes a kind of symbol of the chaos and the confusion and the loss of Tian Ming, the sort of loss of the royal mandate, uh, power, the emperor's mandate, and from the assassination attempt. So this, anything that happened in the Qin dynasty becomes a kind of uh, symbol for how not to be an emperor. Also, be right below this, we can see Nu Wan and Hu Xi holding the compass and a square, the circle and the square, these two forms that kind of bind the universe together, the sense of the yin and the yang. More on that later. Here is an amazing collection of rubbings from the shine of the Wu family in the Han Dynasty. Uh, and through these elaborate rubbings, they've been able to sort of reconstruct the kind of mythology that was prevalent at this time, the sense of hierarchy, like the flyaway garment, the sense of the ordered structure of the universe, that things have their place and people have their roles, and that sort of Confucian ideal of a well-ordered society is depicted in these rubbings. Here's another uh, image from that tomb, the Fusang tree, the sort of mythological tree of life. This has echoes of this that earlier money tree I showed you. This idea of the Fusang tree uh, shows us the, the, you know, the abundance of wealth and prosperity. The Fusang became known as a kind of idea of a, of, of, of a land, of a place where you might find immortality. And so the tree becomes sort of this idea of a, a kind of faraway place. And emperors were known to have actually sent expeditions out in search of this grand and glorious uh, place, which promised immortality. Rubbings would also become a very important way in which uh, samples of calligraphy would be passed along. And we'll talk a lot more about calligraphy in the next lectures. But it's important to note that early at this time, one of the chief means for sort of preserving and communicating calligraphy was through this. This is where someone has etched into the stone the image of the character as it looks or appears sort of as if it had been painted by hand. So that's why the characters are white and the background is dark. There is this, the, the character has been sort of etched into the stone, and so the rubbing reveals that character with extraordinary detail. And this is how we have actually some of the very rare examples of old forms of calligraphy that have been preserved through the centuries. So let's have our review quiz. Again, these are questions that you should be able to answer having completed this lecture. Question one. What are some of the central themes of Confucian thought? How and why were Confucian values adopted by the imperial government? Question three. 
What ways did Confucian thought influence the Han Dynasty? Question 4. What kinds of new tomb objects appear in the Han Dynasty? Why were rubbings important for decimating Confucian values?